Good morning. Jory did a great job, didn't he? <laughs> it, it is a real pleasure to be here with you. And uh, I've heard you've had a, uh, a great conference and uh, hopefully you're gonna go back to your schools rejuvenated with some uh, fresh ideas on how to keep your schools lively and learning and uh, be ready uh, to meet those students when they arrive come the fall, although these days a lot of schools start in August, so. <laughs> uh, but it's good to be here. Uh, I can't help but reflect, though, on the state of our country. Uh, we are living in troubled times. Went to bed thinking about events in Minnesota and Louisiana, woke up hearing about Dallas. So I just think it is important if we take a moment of silence just to reflect on where we are. Um, if you pray, pray for the nation. If you don't, meditate. <laughs> Thank you. I think sometimes when um, events of this nature happen, uh, the worst thing we can do is act like nothing happened um, and just go on like it's all normal. Uh, our kids are aware of these events. Uh, all you have to do is be connected to Facebook and you know things are happening. And I know many schools struggle with what do we do? How do we talk about these incidents when they occur? And I, there are no easy answers and that's a whole nother lecture I could do about that. But I don't think we should ever treat mass violence as normal. And uh, Eli Weissel, who just died, we, we don't get a chance to actually, um, Eli Weissel, <laughs> uh, who just died, the Holocaust survival, no, survivor, Nobel Prize winner, um, he, he made a point of that, saying that, you know, part of what is our responsibility as citizens, citizens of the world, that is, is to never be silent in the face of atrocity, in the face of human rights violations. So I encourage you as educational leaders never to lose your voice. Uh, <clears throat> I also want to say uh, how important education and schools are during these troubled times. Uh, because for many of our kids, the schools they attend are the most stable part of their lives. It's the place where they know there are adults around who care about them, the place where they know they'll be fed, and we know we live in a country where there are many kids who don't eat on a regular basis. Uh, it's a place where they know where uh, they will have some degree of stability and even hopefully predictability, uh, which is so important for child development. And uh, you are the, the people that make that possible. You are the people that create that haven of hope and possibility. Uh, and so, I've become increasingly cynical about politics, but I am not cynical about principles uh, because principles are some of the hardest working people in this country. Uh, you do this work not for the money. If you did, you'd be very bitter by now, right? <laughs> you do it for the importance that you know is attached to not just preparing our kids academically, but preparing them for life. I often remind people that uh, our work is, is about much more than test scores. If our kids get high test scores, but they get strung out on drugs, we have still failed. And if they are getting straight A's, but they're depressed and anxious and uh, can't function the world, then we have not succeeded. And keeping in mind, what does it take to really make a difference for our kids, I think is what it, it has to stay central to our work if in fact we're going to be able to serve all children well. So it's with that spirit in mind that I want to spend some time with you talking about the work, the work you do, the work that's so challenging, that's so time consuming, the work that often comes at the expense of your health, because right? you're putting in so much time at work, you don't have time to eat good, healthy meals or to get exercise or enough sleep. The work that often comes at the expense of your time with your families. <laughs> Um, so this work, this is really critical work, uh, and it's very easy to get, I think, confused about what's most important. In the context of education, there's two different types of work going on all the time. And I'm going to call the technical work and the adaptive work. Both are important. Can't ignore either one. 
the technical work for a principal is about running your school. It's about making sure the buses run on time, making sure you've got a teacher who's certified in the classroom, making sure that the cafeteria is clean, making sure that the Xerox machine is working, making sure you fill out all the reports, that your school is in compliance with all the policies, federal, state, local. You are managing large, complex organizations, even if your school is small, because you're still the chief uh, human re uh, resources officer, right? You have to figure out how to hire, how to promote, how to discipline. You've got to figure out how to keep that school running well. But that's only part of the job. That's the technical part, the managerial part. The other part is the adaptive part. That's the part that forces you to reflect on the work you're doing and ask yourself, Am I, in fact, making a difference? Are my students engaged? Are my teachers inspired? Are my parents really my partners who trust me and trust this school? Is the morale of my staff high enough so that it will sustain them through the year, even in March, when there are no more holidays and it's still cold out? That's adaptive work, because you can't do that work from your office, can you? You gotta do it in interaction with your staff, in interaction with the students and parents you work with. It's a different kind of work, because it's constantly forcing you to develop the skills that Daniel Goleman spoke about earlier this week, your social and your emotional intelligence. Instructional leadership is always adaptive work, it's never technical. Because you have to know how to give feedback that's constructive, that's helpful, sometimes that's critical, and do it in a way that allows your school to improve. If you're confused about the technical and the adaptive, I would say think about the relationship that you're in or would like to be in. Usually you don't approach another person by saying, you know, I'd like to pay bills with you for the rest of your life. Although if you've ever been in a relationship, you know paying bills is a big part of that relationship, right? But if that's all it is, what happens? Relationship usually doesn't last. It falls apart. Because if there's no communication, no love, no sharing, over time, the relationship lapses into an arrangement that just is not fulfilling. Schools can never be like that. Schools can never be places where people just show up because they're doing what's required for the job description. Schools can't afford to be places where we are working in isolation from each other because the best schools, the schools that succeed in making a difference, are greater than the sum of their parts. Think about that for a moment, to be greater than the sum of your parts. It means we achieve more because we work together. And we work together because we're united by a common vision, a vision that allows us to think creatively about how to meet the needs of our children. So that adaptive work is essential. It's essential because when we don't do the adaptive work, our schools fail. And it may not fail because you have low test scores. Some of our schools that are really failing have high test scores. They're failing because they haven't captured the imagination of the children and the kids are bored. They're failing because they haven't figured out how to get the parents to be responsible. They're failing because they haven't figured out a way to keep the teachers inspired. So don't be fooled by the test scores. Test scores are important, but it's only one indicator. There's so many other indicators out there for how well we're doing. And I think that sometimes we lose sight of that. In this age of accountability and assessment, we have focused too narrowly on achievement. And we have missed the larger project. That is getting kids excited about learning. That is creating it in a school where the conditions are conducive to good teaching and learning, where the culture is conducive to good teaching and learning. Think of your school as a garden, and you are the chief gardener. 
you got to make sure all the ingredients are in place for that garden to flourish. You got to make sure that the school is a place conducive to good teaching and learning. And like a gardener, if the kids aren't learning, if they're not performing, you don't blame them. What gardener would blame the tomatoes, right? You ask, what have we gotten wrong here? What's missing? What do we need to do differently to engage and inspire and motivate these children? So keeping clear about the adaptive work, I think, is essential, especially because we're faced with such enormous challenges. The challenge I'm going to speak most about today is how do we pursue excellence and equity, which in many communities are seen as being at odds. We're either doing one or the other. I'd say you've got to do both. In fact, I would say the pathway to excellence is through equity. Because lots of our kids are capable of excellence if provided the opportunity to learn. In addition, we've got to close these gaps. Gaps that are deeply entrenched, gaps that are predictable, gaps that are consistent, pervasive, and in some places growing. We've got to create schools that reduce those disparities. Schools where a child's race or socioeconomic status or language does not predict how well they will do. And that might be challenging, but guess what? I'll bet you in this audience today, how many of you come from a family with neither of your parents graduated from college? Raise your hand. Look around the room. Lots of folks. How many come from a family with neither parent graduated from high school? Still got some hands up. Mine too. And those of us with our hands up are living proof that your background should not determine what you can accomplish. So we have to ask ourselves, is that true in my school? Is my school a place that expands opportunities, that builds on the talents and strengths of children? Or is my school a place where we are reproducing patterns of inequality? in our society. We've got to turn around the underperforming schools, and those who've been at it for a while know it takes real work to turn them around, doesn't it? It's more than a command. You can't, no magic wands out there, turn around, right? It's capacity building. Building the capacity of our schools, of our staff. Here's the key. If the skills of your staff match the needs of your kids, guess what happens? They learn. They learn. And the skills are not simply the academic skills, though that's critical. They have to know how to relate to those children, don't they? Because kids learn through relationships. And if they can only teach kids that don't need much help, you ever go to someone, they only can work with kids who are highly motivated, whose parents are doing all the work, that's a problem. Because it means the kids who actually need help are going to be the kids that we do least well with. So figuring out how do we become a school that's truly value added, that's good for serving all kinds of children, is a huge challenge. Figuring out how to do this work with, within a context of unpredictable financing. We are too often asked to do more with less, facing tough decisions about cutting staff and cutting programs that you know are vital to your school. That's part of the environment, and it's also in the context of policies that often make the work so much more difficult. I could give a whole nother presentation just on that. Policies that confuse support for schools with pressure. I've never seen schools improve because of threats and pressure. Never have. But our policies rely on threats and pressure, don't they? They rely on uh, the idea that somehow if we threaten to fire people, that'll get them working. Yeah. Well, I see lots of evidence that doesn't work at all. We have an accountability system that holds those with the most power the least accountable. That's not a good recipe for success. But despite the bad policies, Despite the lack of guidance that we receive, particularly from the states that we're in, you've still got to figure out how to do this work in spite of it. <laughs> and 
And the good news is that there are plenty of schools out there that are. They're not waiting for the right governor to get elected. They're not waiting for the right state legislature to come into office. They are getting the work done right now because they know the kids can't wait. So it's a challenge, but it's a challenge we've got to rise to. And we've got to rise to it despite the fact that the public is increasingly frustrated because of the attacks on public education. Attacks that come from all corners. Because the media too often focuses on the negative. And we have this narrative out there that our teachers are lazy, that our teachers are incompetent, that they're uneducated. Very hard to attract people in the teaching profession when that's the message out there about them, isn't it? We are seeing public schools in many of our cities dismantled because there's a disinvestment in public education. So part of what we've got to do is we've got to make sure that our communities, that our parents understand our commitment to them, to their kids. The best way to counter this negativity towards public education is to create excellent schools where we are. So that there's a constituency out there to defend and say, I don't know about those other schools, but my school, kids my school go, children go to, is exceptional. You are ultimately the defenders, the advocates of public education. And that's a lot to put on your plate, isn't it? You say, damn, I thought I was just running a school. I got to defend the whole system now. But it's interesting, when you look at the polling data, people judge their opinions on public education based on their experiences in the public schools. And so we've got a lot to do to rise to these challenges. So for that reason, I want to try to equip you in the time I have today with some perspective about how to approach the work. And a lot of this shouldn't be new because any educator who's been at this for a while should understand. There's so much more to creating a school where kids are successful, to creating a school with high achievement than simply focusing on test scores. We created a framework in our book, Excellence Through Equity, for pursuing excellence through equity. And then we identified schools and districts around the country that are doing it because the good news is this is in fact happening. This is not made up. And you look closely at the places where it's happening. I was at a place like that in Baltimore a few months ago, Halstead Elementary School. Every teacher on the, in the school has their own professional development plan. Every teacher. Why? Because they don't all need the same things. Some of them are strong in content. Some of them are weak in content. Some of them are great with pedagogy. Some of them don't even know how to use a, a computer. And many of them struggle in developing strong, positive relationships. But they're not struggling anymore because this is a school that despite serving kids in poverty, despite being in one of the poorest cities in the United States, is a school that's a beacon of hope. Go visit, it's in Baltimore County. And you will see a school where kids are excited about learning. And if you can do that in Baltimore, I know we can do that anywhere in America today. If We've got the vision. And first of all, that vision's got to be rooted in an understanding of child development, which is really the cornerstone of education, isn't it? Piaget, remember Piaget? Remember Maslow? <laughs> remember those guys? <laughs> Dewey? It was all about understanding the developmental needs of children. Understanding there's a spectrum out there. Some kids will walk early, talk early, read early. Some kids take more time. Being an early walker or talker or reader doesn't mean that you are necessarily more advanced than the other children. I have five of my own. First one walked at nine months. I was so proud as if I had something to do with it. Fourth one didn't walk till she was almost 16 months. I was so worried. I thought she'd crawl forever. They all walk around fine now. They're all over the place. <laughs> Even when you don't achieve average yearly progress at walking, it's not a prediction for how well good a walker you'll be later. Right. How do you make sure that the developmental lens doesn't get lost? 
that we really do think through what's developmentally appropriate for our children at different stages. One of the things that reminds us of is that children learn through the arts. Think about this, it was a common practice in this country for years, for every kindergarten classroom to have a piano. And for the kindergarten teachers to know how to play the piano, right? Anybody remember the pianos? Do you still have pianos? Some of you do. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. Because kids still like music, don't they? They sure do. How many of you know kids that have memorized the lyrics to hundreds of songs? I know them. What does that tell you about the capacity of the brain to retain information, particularly when it's connected to music? Music, the arts, physical education are as important as science and math and literacy because they all help to enrich us as individuals. We should never, never be fooled into a narrow vision of education where that which is not on the test is taken away from the children. Music's never on the test. Neither is recess. Give them music and recess anyway. I saw a study that said that uh, eating lunch was good for test scores. I said, thank God. Thank God. They might take lunch from the kids. That's the kind of narrow mindset I'm seeing creep into too many schools because of the policies we pursue. So child development's got to remain the cornerstone of our work. Visiting a, a school in Boston, Mission Hill Prime, uh, Elementary School, it's a K-8 school. Enter the kindergarten classroom. There's a boat, a wooden boat in the middle of the classroom. First thing I ask is, how did you get the boat in here? They say, well, the parents built it for us. Second question is, what's it for? They said, of course, reading. Because you put a five-year-old in a boat, guess what happens? They're gone. Because they're tapping into the imagination of the children, even as they're also teaching basic skills in literacy. Learning should be fun. Learning shouldn't be a pain. It should be the more they're in school, the more they want to learn, not the less. We've got to cultivate in our children a love of learning that extends beyond the test, that lasts all the way through summer, all the way past graduation, that continues on through life, because that's what is essential in a democratic society. So child development's got to be key, but so does the neuroscience. I realize that's a big word, and people say, well, I'm not a neuroscientist. Well, guess what? The neuroscience is coming out now is telling us the brain is not fixed. It's elastic. The term that's used is neuroplasticity. It's like a muscle. The brain works through stimulation. That means all children have to be stimulated, all children. And it means that rather than measuring achievement or ability and sorting accordingly, a practice common in many schools that doesn't just begin in middle school, but often begins very early when we start creating reading groups. Right? And we assign all the kids who are struggling to the same group with a nice struggling teacher. Right? And then wonder why they never catch up. Right? Neuroscience says, no, all kids have to be stimulated. All children have to be challenged. Rigor is essential, but rigor is not just a lot of work. That's a misunderstanding of what rigor is. Rigor is about being made to think hard, being compelled to problem solve, being compelled to use those brain cells to apply what you've learned in different contexts, because when that happens, it sticks. And it results in a person becoming not just smarter, but more capable and competent you know, we now know about resilience. Resilience is the byproduct of confidence and competence. All of our children have to become resilient, have to be able to pick themselves up when they fall, have to be able to learn from their mistakes. So the neuroscience is telling us that that mindset is so critical to outcomes, life outcomes. Third, we've got to understand context. Who are these kids anyway? What's going on in their life outside of school? How do they learn when they're not with us? How does a child learn to fish? Learn to cook? Learn to play a video game? What do you know about learning? How many of you ever watched a kid play a video game? New one. 
Do they get a lecture on it first through direct instruction? <laughs> or do they learn by doing? Right. And even ask questions as they go along the way. If they, if they struggle, they might call a friend. We call that cheating in school. Right? And as they're learning, they make mistakes. They die sometimes, right? We get to come back. Because that's how we learn, isn't it? We learn through our mistakes. Is your school a safe place for making mistakes? Or do we hold mistakes against kids? Ultimately, when you're learning that new video game or learning to fish or learn to cook, how do we know you really learned it? It's because you master it. You nail it and you're able to go on to a higher level because you have the foundation. How many of your kids are experiencing mastery in your school? How many of your kids can say, you know, I mastered the timetables. I'm ready for long division. I mastered the fractions. I'm ready for decimals. What happens when we don't experience mastery and we get pushed along with a weak foundation? We're not ready for what comes next, are we? So understand the context, understanding who we work with. We're living at a time of great demographic change in this country. New immigrants coming, families changing, economy unsettling, people losing jobs, losing their homes. All of those issues are educational. They're all educational. The more you know about who you serve, the more you'll know about how to serve them. And that doesn't mean studying them through some demographic category, like race or income or language. Our kids are more than that. You know a person's race, you still know nothing about them. You don't know about their interests, you don't know about their personality, you don't know about their temperament or their learning style. We can't let stereotypes be a shorthand for real knowledge about who we work with. So I encourage you, know your community. Your communities look to you for leadership. They trust you. Who else would put their five-year-olds and say, here you go, I'm giving you my five-year-olds. What an act of faith, isn't it? They do it every year. And we've got to make sure that when they send them to us, we give them our very best. So there's good research out there on what the very best looks like done in Chicago, by the University of Chicago over a 10-year period, they studied reform. They studied how schools responded to the various reforms that were implemented by the school system. And now what's interesting is this is when former Secretary of Duncan was superintendent. So many of the reforms that were carried in Chicago later became federal policy. Shutting down schools, race for the top, remember that one? Well, here's what the research showed. Some schools got better and stayed good. And they had five things in common. First, they had a coherent instructional guidance system. What that means is teachers aren't doing their own thing. It means there's a, a, a real plan in place for how we deliver instruction. It doesn't mean there's uniformity. Very important because teaching is art and skill, and we never want to kill the art of teaching. But there is clarity about what children should learn, what the objectives are. Secondly, there's ongoing attention to develop the professional capacity of the staff. That's how we make sure that the skills of the staff match the needs of the kids. Right now, if you look at your data, your data will tell you if that's the case. If your kids can't do math, you know what it means? It means your teachers can't teach math to them. And if you're in a place where there's changing demographics and you have a large number of English language learners now, you're not gonna solve that with an ESL specialist. Every teacher's gonna have to learn how to teach those kids, provide sheltered instruction. When we are attentive to building the professional skills of our staff, what we find is that our kids do better. They do better academically, they do better socially as well. That's the capacity building work that you've got to lead. Third, strong parent community ties. Why? Because all the research shows over 50% of student achievement is influenced by what parents do. 
And if you don't have strong relationships with your parents so that they're reinforcing at home what is important to learning and to social development, what we find is the kids with the least support will do least well. That's what your data shows right now, doesn't it? Kids who are doing the best, I bet you almost all of them have a lot of parental support. So then the question becomes, how do we get more parents to be our partners? Partnerships with parents have to be rooted in trust and respect. The parents actually have to believe we care about their kids, that we're doing what's right. And when it's genuinely understood by the parents that this principal, this staff believes in my child, you don't end up fighting each other. You're working together. And that kind of reinforcement, that kind of alignment leads to real gains for children. Fourth, a student-centered learning climate, a culture, a culture that where the relationships, the values, the ethics, the mission are all aligned with the goals of education, with the goals and vision of the school. Culture matters. It matters so much, culture trumps organization and staff, it trumps technology, it trumps just by any other innovation that we often seize upon in education, because education is driven so much by gimmicks, isn't it? We, we think the latest gimmick, and you probably had a lot of <laughs> vendors downstairs telling you, telling you, buy this and this will make your school great, right? Well, the one thing you can't buy down there is a culture. And here's the challenge, cultures can't be imposed on schools. Cultures develop organically through relationships, through shared vision, through buy-in, through internal accountability. Internal accountability is more important than external accountability. When we are accountable to each other, when we can have honest, ca candid conversations about our work, guess what happens? We get better. That's about a culture. The morale of your staff is a culture. I've never seen a high-performing school where people don't work hard. I've never seen a contract that makes people work hard. How do you create an environment where people are willing to go the extra mile, call parents on their own time, stay late if they need to to tutor kids, come in on the weekend if they have to to design and organize their classrooms? You can't mandate that, but you can create an environment where that becomes the norm. Fifth, shared leadership. Share leadership because it's important you as you are, as principals, it's not all about you. What's the sign of a great principal? That you're not indispensable. The school doesn't fall apart when you're not around because others step up, they take initiative, they understand what has to be done. What are you doing to create that sense of shared leadership, distributed leadership in your school? That has to be based on trust too, doesn't it? has to be based on a sense of what we're about, of shared mission. I was at a school not long ago in, in, in Brooklyn, in East New York, one of the poorest neighborhoods in the city. I arrive at the school, I'm greeted by the guard, signing in. Mom comes up with her five-year-old. She says to the guard, I'm late, I don't have time for this. Guard says, you can go, come here, sweetie. Calls the child over. Mom leaves. I turn to the guard and say, well, that's unusual. She's supposed to sign him in, isn't she? She said, yes, she is. I said, but I can see she was stressed. Guard is exercising leadership. I walk up the stairs, run to a little boy. He's walking up too, but it looks like, I thought he had a broken leg. He was walking up so slowly. I said, what's wrong? He said, I'm tired. We get upstairs, principal sees him. First thing she says to him, is I'm so glad you're here, but you're late. We're waiting for you, you gotta get to class. Take off your hat, pull up your pants, get to class. But the first message was, I'm happy to see you. I'm happy to see you because she knows that that child comes to schools with enormous burdens that he may not be able to explain at nine because we got kids out there who are quite small carrying huge burdens that they can't even explain sometimes but she knows she has to create a place, an environment where they're gonna be feeling good because if they feel good, they're gonna do better academically. 
And then I go to meet the assistant principal and he's in there disciplining a student. Except it doesn't sound like discipline, it sounds like a praise session. And he's going on about how you're a leader here, you're a role model, people look up to you, but you're making bad decisions, bad choices. And then I come in and he starts to explain to me all the talents of this young man and all the great things he's doing and the bad decisions that he sometimes makes. And the boy is beaming by the time he's finished. He says, now go back to class. You're going to eat lunch with me today. You don't get to play with the other kids. And we're going to talk some more about your bad decisions. Because this assistant principal knows the goal of discipline is not to punish kids. It's to change behavior. And how do we know we're actually succeeding at changing behavior? It means that we're not seeing the same kids over and over again. So this is the five. These are the five essential ingredients of school reform. You want to read more about it? Read Tony Bright's book, Organizing Schools for Improvement. Are you surprised by anything on the list? Shouldn't be, right? Now ask ourselves, what are we really focused on in my school? How do we rate on those five? Where are we strong? Where are we in need of improvement? I think part of the reason why more of our schools don't improve is because they're focused on the wrong things. And they're missing the essential ingredients. And one of those essential ingredients is equity. There's so much confusion about what equity is, isn't there? Because people confuse it with equality. Not the same, is it? Can't treat them all the same. Why? Because they're all different. That's why. Even identical twins are different, aren't they? I had one, one parent, she explained to me, she has an identical boy. She said, they are so different, they look alike, totally different. First word of one was jump. First word of his brother was snuggle. And I tell you everything about temperament and personality. I have five kids, all different. Anybody with more than one child practices equity at home, don't you? Because our goal is to give our kids what they need to be successful, not to treat them the same. So giving them what they need to be successful might mean focusing on both the academic and the social needs of children. Because they don't all need the same thing. Some kids don't have support at home, they're going to need a mentor at school. Some kids need more time. Some kids need constant attention and feedback. And some kids need some time to be alone because that's how they learn best. Knowing our children and figuring out how do we accommodate is so important to this work. There's a whole move, it's not a movement, it's, a, it's a, not new, but it's taking off in many places a personalization. Because the alternative to treating everyone the same is to meet the needs of different kids. And we have technology that allows us now to do that much more than we ever did before. So equity has to be a part of the lived experience of our schools. It can't be a slogan. It's got to show up in our practices. It's got to show up in the way we work, how we work, how we grapple and struggle with our challenges. The challenge is about the kids whose needs we're not meeting, as well as the kids who we think are doing well. Because many of those kids aren't even working at their potential, are they? They've just mastered the game of school. They're really good at giving us what we, they, th what we th they think we want. So it forces us to really reflect on the nature of our work. At the same time, we can never lose sight that we're aimed at aiming for excellence. We're aiming for our kids to be successful. We're aiming for them to develop their full potential, to not settle. Angela Duckworth, written so much about the importance of grit. I think that so many people have mistaken and misunderstood this concept because grit is not just something poor kids need. Grit is something all kids need, all kids. That ability to work hard, that ability to apply myself, that ability to aim high. If you're ready for it, when you go back to your schools, I want you to tell your staff, treat every assignment a student turns in as a first draft. First draft. Because I don't do my best work on the first draft. How many of you do your best work on the first draft? 
The real learning is not the first submission. The real learning is in the revision. And the real teaching is not in the grading. It's in the feedback. It's in modeling and helping the child to understand why that's not good enough. This is what we're aiming for. And we're giving them multiple opportunities to improve. Because that's how real learning takes place for our children. When we do that, when kids start to learn that we don't just accept slop because we know they're capable of so much more, they stop turning in slop. They start aiming higher for themselves. When the parents know that we are serious in our commitment to excellence for kids, they'll stop doing the homework for them. How many of you know parents who are doing homework for their kids, right? You see those uh, term papers or, or those dioramas that look like an architect built it? And dad is an architect. If you're ready for it, push for revise and resubmit as a strategy. If you're ready for it, tell your teachers stop focusing on achievement. And start getting your kids excited about learning. Think about the difference. When we focus on achievement, what do we do? We focus on the test scores. We focus on the measures we're going to use which means invariably we end up narrowing the curriculum to that which will be on the test and ignoring all the other things that are so important. If we focus on getting kids excited about learning, getting them to see and understand the magic of science, you know what happens? Learning is not just fun. Learning becomes a creative process for kids and for teachers. So I want to encourage you to be willing to unleash the potential of your children and your teachers. Empower them. Empower them as learners. They can see what's possible. That's what Sadie Silva did in New York at Bed-Stuyvesant, PS28. We have very fancy names for our schools in New York City. <laughs> Public School 28. School where over 30% of the kids are homeless, over 25% have IEPs. And despite all the challenges related to poverty, this is a school that's a high-performing school. When I go to visit Sadie, the first person she introduced me to is her secretary. She said, I want you to meet the person who does all the administrative work at the school. I said, well, that's great. Then what do you do? She said, I'm the lead teacher. I didn't become a principal to escape the classroom. She said, come and let me take you to see some classrooms. And every classroom we visit, I see four and five adults. I'm wondering, how do you get all so many teachers in here? She said, they're not all teachers. Most of them are parents we train to work with teachers. Our parents work with teachers. Some of them just make copies. Some of them just hand out books. I see one parent standing right next to a little boy. I said, why is she so close to him? She said, well, she's there to keep him calm. And we're glad she's here because he needs to be calm. <laughs> it's a school that works through a series of partnerships with health services and the YMCA for extended learning opportunities. It works with <clears throat> job training agencies so that parents who need it can get GED classes and job training because she believes that if parents are educated and employed, they'll do a better job with the kids. She said, let me show you the professional uh, development I have going on today for my teachers. Takes me to a room and there's a workshop being run by two social workers on how to respond to the social and emotional needs of children. And the teachers are posing questions about challenges they see in the children, kids who are anxious, children who are aggressive, who are depressed. One teacher says, I have a child with attachment issues. He's attached to my leg and I can't teach. And in each case, they're giving them practical advice on what to do differently. They say, come back, we'll talk about it again, see if it worked. And I asked Sadie, I said, what made you decide to offer this as a form of professional development for your staff? She said, until I did, they were referring too many kids to special ed. I had to figure out how to get them more skilled. You need to be more skilled to work in a school like this, not less skilled. So those kinds of schools exist. I can name others. And always what you see is, is principals who are instructional leaders. They're very clear about what good teaching is and how to cultivate it within the schools. They're working at parental support. They're building community partnerships. They're not waiting for help. You know why they don't wait? Because help ain't coming, that's why. They're making it happen. They're resourceful. They're going out and getting the help their schools and their children need. They're building the capacity of the teachers. They're not blaming them. They're helping them to get better. 
And lastly, they're providing individualized support to their children. Every child at PS28 had a learning plan. Every child. Nothing left to chance. They know exactly who, who, where they are, what kind of help they need. So we need to learn from these examples. We need to make sure we're doing what works and not doing the things that clearly don't work. Right? Some things that clearly don't work is assigning kids who are behind to the least effective teachers. Show me the research to support that strategy. But it's a common one, isn't it? Um, not providing access to rigorous instruction because we don't think the kids are capable. Dumbing it down, slowing it down. You never catch up by going slower, do you? No, you don't. Not intervening early. Early intervention is so much more effective than late intervention, isn't it? You know, one of the signs that, that kids are not making progress, they start showing up early. They don't show up in sixth grade, they're showing up in second and third grade. So much easier to teach a child to read in second and third grade than in sixth, much less 10th grade. What are we doing to ex engage our kids? What are we doing to make sure they have a clear sense of what it takes to be successful? All of these things lead to better outcomes for kids. And since I'm out of time, I want to just show you this one last picture. <laughs> Here's a school in East LA I work with, Hollenbeck Middle School, it's a K-8 school. These kids are in a math class doing algebra. And look at them, they're up out of their seats. And the teacher's so good, she can stand in the back and talk to me. Because the kids are in control of learning. And all of these kids are poor. All of these kids are English language learners. All these kids are immigrant kids. This is a gang-ridden neighborhood with all kinds of problems. But they're in a class where they are engaged, where they're motivated, where they're learning from each other, which means that they're not just learning math, they are learning the social skills in the context of math. And because they're on task, you know what she gets to do? She could do yoga if she wanted to, but she gets to differentiate support. She gets to move amongst those kids and see who's got it, who does it, who needs more time, who needs more help. This is the highest form of classroom management, isn't it? Why? Because the kids are totally engaged. Who are your teachers that know how to teach like this? Who are the teachers that don't? What are you doing to make sure they have a clear vision for what's possible? Too many of our teachers are still teaching through the cemetery method. You know the cemetery method? Line them up in rows, keep them as still as possible. It's deadly, boring, doesn't work for lots of kids, lots of kids. We've got to find a way to keep them engaged. And engagement is multidimensional. It is behavioral, it is cognitive, and it is emotional. We want the kids to actually care. So I can say more, but I can't because I'm out of time. But I will say this, I get to see amazing things throughout the country, in all kinds of places, places where you wouldn't expect it. I get to see schools that will make you, leave me inspired. And that's one of the reasons why my optimism about the future of education has never died. Because I go to too many places where I see people making a huge difference. So I want you to reflect on why you're in this work in the first place. We already said it's not about the money, right? <laughs> Definitely not about the money. The real question is, how do we know? How do we know if the schools we lead are places where love of learning is being cultivated, a place where our children are truly being prepared to live in a democratic society? Well, they will have the incredible responsibility of voting intelligently in the future. The future of this country will be determined by what happens in its schools. That's how important it is. And even if the attacks on you and the criticisms on you are great sometimes, never lose sight of that. Because the fact is that our schools continue to be the beacon of hope for so many children across America. Our schools are, for many of our kids, all that remains of the social safety net in this country. So I want to encourage you to think about why you do the work, how to make sure you're making a difference. Let me close by describing one more school this one in the Bronx, PS138, another school with a fancy name. 
This one's on Willis Avenue, a part of the Bronx that burned in the 1970s. Burned because a lot of the neighbors were, a lot of landlords were burning their property rather than fixing it up. So it looked like a war zone. My grandmother lived in the housing products on Willis Avenue for over 20 years, so I knew the neighborhood well. So when I heard that PS 138 was a high performing school, I asked to visit because I said I have to see this for myself. How do you create a high performing school in that kind of poverty and devastation? So I go to visit and I'm greeted by a little girl. She's about in fourth grade. She says, I'm your tour guide. I said, okay, let's go. First thing she shows me is all the awards the school's written, won. They've got articles written about it. They've got awards from the state consistently over several years. Takes me to the library and explains that there's an ongoing competition amongst the classrooms for which class reads the most books. Whole books, not excerpts from books, but whole books. Because they believe that if kids get access to good literature, they'll want to read more right, on their own time. We walk through the hall and I'm impressed by the artwork and the student work up on the walls. And I let the girl know, I said, this is a beautiful school. I'm so impressed. She said, well, you haven't seen anything yet. Let me take you upstairs. More impressive. We go upstairs and I learn the only museum in New York City dedicated to the history of the Bronx is in their school but it's not locked away in a classroom, it's in the hallways. There's memorabilia on display. There are pictures of the Yankees from the 1920s. First album by Donald Byrd, a jazz artist who lived in that neighborhood is encased in glass. First thing that comes to my mind is that all of this stuff that's part of this museum could easily be broken, could be taken, could be stolen. So I turn to the little girl, I say, aren't they worried that some of this could get, you know, abused or mistaken, and the little girl turns to me and says, I don't know about the schools you go to normally. <laughs> but at this school, kids know how to take care of things. Why do I ask the question? Because I'm too often going to schools where kids are treated like inmates in a prison, where they're not trusted, where they're not inspired, where they're not empowered, but where they're regimented. I was visiting a science classroom in a city in Northern California. No science equipment. I asked the science teacher, where's the science equipment? She said, I got in the closet, I lock it up. I said, why do you lock it up? She said, I lock it up so they don't break it. I said, will they ever get to use it? She said, occasionally, when they're good, I let them use it. She reminded me of those people, you ever go to someone's house and their furniture's covered? They're like, they're waiting for someone special to come for a visit. And you know, if it's covered, when you come, you're not the special one, right? Okay. The kids at PS 138 are treated like they're special every day and they rise to the expectations. Our children will rise to our expectations. We gotta believe that. I wish you all the best. Have a great year. Thank you for having me today.